So in this overview presentation, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll in a moment hand it over to Paula Olsuski from the Sloan Foundation. She'll talk a little bit about the Sloan Foundation and this uh, indoor chemistry program. Then Dr. Corsi from UT is going to talk a little bit about the importance of indoor air. Uh, Attila Novoselic, also from UT, will, will introduce you to the, the test house. And then uh, Marina Rands and Delphine Frommer are the um, main PIs of the Home Camp project and they'll give an overview of the project. So with that, I'll turn it over to Paula. Well, good morning. My name is Paula Olsuski. I'm a program director at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation in New York City. We are the primary funder of Home Chem, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on the foundation and how we uh, actually got to Home Chem. So, uh, just use, the use which one? Yeah, the keyboard. Just use this. All right. All right, so the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation is a philanthropic foundation located at Rockefeller Center in New York City. We're a small foundation focused on research and education in STEM fields, including economics. We give away approximately $80 million a year. Almost all of our grants are invited, and they're subject to very rigorous internal and external Review. Oh, I forgot to say these remarks are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Sloan Foundation. <laughs> Just so you know that. Um, so anyway, the I trained as a chemist. I got my PhD in chemistry from MIT a long time ago. And ever since I got to the foundation, I've been dreaming, how can we have a chemistry program? So fortunately, I and some other people came up with the idea that people are studying outdoor air. Atmospheric chemists have fabulous instrumentation. They have all sorts of methods and tools. And why not bring them indoors where they can study where we spend all of our time? So the bottom line is I developed a program um, to basically elucidate the indoor chemistry, basically to create a new field of scientific inquiry. We, went, we got into this field because there was almost little or no funding. We want to identify indoor sources. We want to um, elucidate the chemical and physical transformations. We want to understand the role of the building and the role of the occupants. We think modeling is very important, so we have a, a modeling theme um, that goes across. So here, $10 million. That's that's real money. Uh, we have already had 20 publications. Again, we fund academic research. The way that they disseminate that those findings are through papers and through um, talks. And I've just listed a bunch of uh, grant grantees up here. All right, so how did we get to Home Chem? Well, the genesis of Home Chem came about from our program strategy. We, in addition to funding research, we wanted to fund a network that is a community of people and various activities that they need as scientists, engineers, um, architects, and so on. And we also knew that there a lot of data would be generated. And we thought it was very important to get a handle on this big data early on. So I invited proposals from uh, Professor Nina Vance on the left and Professor Delphine Farmer on the right to do planning activities to develop a network for the Chemistry of Indoor Environments program and to develop sort of data and instrumentation sharing policies for the program. They did their, did their work and they came back to me and said, we want to do home chem. It will establish the community. It will help us establish the data sharing, and we'll really have a lot of fun at the test site. And my first response was, wow, this is a great idea. And my second response is, do I have enough money? But fortunately, I did. And I also, because the previous program that's winding down, the microbiology of the built environment, I knew lots of fabulous building science, particularly here at UT Austin. And so I, I introduced uh, Nina and Delphine to this UT Dream Team. You see in the, the center, we've got Professor Rich Corsi. Uh, on the left, we have Professor Attila Novoselic. And on the right, Professor Leah Hildebrand Ruiz. And so the, this, the five of them really are brought it together. And they're going to speak for themselves. But I am truly fortunate 
to be able to fund such high quality researchers and fund exciting research. And I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. So my name is Rich Corsi, as the slide says. Um, I've been doing research on indoor air quality at the University of Texas for about 25 years now. Most of that has been related to indoor chemistry. Uh, and I'll say that for the last 25 years, those of us that work in the indoor chemistry field essentially have been able to scratch the surface in a lot of areas and not dig very deep um, because we just haven't had the resources, either, either the funding resources or the instrumentation to sort of bore deep into things that we see at the surface. And, and I want to acknowledge Paula and, and our colleagues at the Sloan Foundation for this new program because this, this is really the Manhattan Project of, of indoor air chemistry. It's just so exciting to those of us that have been struggling in this field for, for decades now to be able to dig deeper into some of the things that we have seen in the past. We've seen a lot of things. We don't understand those things. We see them and we say, I wonder why that's happening. And now we're going to find out why they're happening. So uh, the most important thing about this slide is my Twitter handle. <laughs> Twitter can follow me. And I tweet a lot about research here and, and, and elsewhere uh, related to indoor air quality. But uh, Leah asked me to speak about why indoor air chemistry and indoor air quality is important. And so I'm just going to show you one slide. Um, and it's why I care about indoor atmospheres, right? So, the numbers that you see at the top of this slide are kind of a secret code for those of us that work in the indoor air quality community. Anybody have an idea of what those numbers mean? Some of you have seen this before, so don't answer if you have. <laughs> what is 79? By the way, the units for each of these numbers are the same. 79 is the average life expectancy of an American today and a Texan, for those of you that live in Texas and don't believe you're American. So uh, <laughs> 79 is the average life expectancy, 81 for women and 77 for men. So there's, there's a gap there, but the average is 79. So 70 then is, Doug? It's the total number of years of those 79 years that we spend domiciled inside of buildings. 70 of 79 years. We spend a greater fraction of our lives inside of buildings than whales spend submerged below the surface of the ocean. So in, in many ways, buildings are our sort of equivalent ocean to what whales are. 50 is the total number of years in our lifetime that we spend domiciled inside of our homes. So if we're interested in places we're expo where we're exposed to air pollution, um, we ought to be looking in our homes. That's the place where we spend most of our lives. Most of the air pollution that we breathe during our lifetimes we breathe inside of our homes, which is why home chem is so important. It's focused on the home, right? 26, anybody have an idea? That's about one third of 79. It's the, average, it's the average number of years that American spends lying horizontally on a mattress with their face pushed up against the pillow, <laughs> breathing in toluene diisocyanate from the polyurethane foam inside the pillow, right? So the bedroom environment is a really, really important environment. That's, where we, that's the microenvironment we spend the greatest fraction of our time during our lives. Five is the total number of years we spend outdoors as Americans, and four is the total number of years we spend in transit as Americans. So those, that's our secret code. Now, the, the fact that we spend so much time in the indoor environment is exciting to me. It's exciting because we know that the indoor environment does affect our health. It, it affects our physical health. If you've ever had an allergic reaction before you've taken an exam, those of you who have been students, which is all of you, I think, you know that it affects your ability to take exams, to study, to do all those things. It affects our productivity. It affects our learning. It affects our mental health as well. Um, and exposure to most air pollutants is dominated by the air we inhale indoors during our lifetimes. That to me excites me because it means that buildings, the places where we spend our entire lifetimes, our ocean, if you will, provide a great opportunity to reduce our exposure to air pollution, and that includes pollution of outdoor origin. So we've done research here at the University of Texas, for example, on one large building where we put in activated carbon filters for eight months uh, in one of the filter banks in the building, and we show that we can reduce ozone concentrations inside the building by about 50% with a fairly low 
investment in, in activated carbon filters or particle filters embedded with activated carbon. So we get this dramatic reduction in people's ozone exposures inside of a building that has 12 air changes per hour. So the indoor environment is pretty much the outdoor environment. And we can knock out about half of at least one bad pollutant in the outdoor environment. And much of the research we focused on in recent years has been on trying to design indoor materials and indoor surfaces that actually do that job for us passively so we can remove pollutants to indoor materials like clay-based paints and clay-based plasters um, very effectively. And so that, that's sort of our research uh, train right now. That's all I have time to say. Are there any questions? The indoor environment is incredibly important. This program is incredibly important because the indoor environment is so important. And, and, and I think over the next eight or nine years, uh, researchers as part of as the Sloan programs, chemistry and the indoor environments program are going are to teach us so much that will help us design better buildings in the future. Okay, so my name is Attila Novoselic. Uh, I'm a professor uh, in civil architecture and environmental engineering, and uh, I'm operating this house for the last uh, 10 years, a little bit more. So um, it's, uh, as you're going to see, it's pre-manufactured home house. It's uh, really nothing uh, special from the point of architecture, but it's quite useful, as you're going to see, uh, for this kind of uh, experiments. And, uh, uh, it was purchased from uh, NSF Iger grant, uh, which was uh, designed to develop uh, uh, research, really, a uh, deep program in, in, in the air quality and uh, educate uh, future leaders uh, in the field of uh, envir indoor environmental science and engineering. And I think we did that quite successful. And uh, as you can see, it is uh, a three bedroom, uh, two bath home. Um, pretty much uh, built uh, 11 years ago. And uh, the purpose was really, really to scale up our testing, uh, which we have uh, in our laboratory. So we start very often with uh, small, relatively inexpensive tests uh, when you test, uh, for example, emission materials in test chambers. And then if you need to put uh, some people uh, in, in this uh, uh, NC reaction with materials uh, or interaction with materials, so you cannot use any more small chambers, you have to use uh, larger test rooms, which we have quite a lot. But again, that's still not real environment, and uh, the, the house is really, really uh, allowing us to do that uh, at, at the full scale and have uh, 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 addition of uh, ambient conditions and uh, all the interactions which are happening in between uh, uh, building materials, uh, occupants, uh, activities uh, associated with occupants. And uh, it is really, really a step towards the full scale field studies. But uh, again, uh, test house is allowing us to really, really have full-scale experiments when you control really, really well certain amount, certain parameters and to measure other. And uh, it is really, really, and if you cannot control, for example, weather, uh, you can really, really characterize it well. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite a useful tool. Uh, and uh, used, we use it primarily for research uh, and also quite a lot in our classes, uh, graduate, undergraduate, for demonstrations. And uh, I'm not going to read all the projects which we have, and this is just a small fraction, really, really. We have a pre probably two dozen of uh, uh, projects uh, associated with uh, uh, pollution, pollutant distribution, uh, uh, removal technologies, uh, reactions. Uh, we had uh, quite a lot of chemistry associated experiments, and uh, however, nothing like home chemistry. Uh, so yeah. nothing at this scale, and this is definitely the largest ever. And I hope uh, we'll continue before, uh, for many years uh, running this kind of experiment before we do our final experiment uh, related to structural stability. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll see we do that quite a lot, uh, the site. Uh, so why you test house? Um, I think uh, maybe uh, Delphine and Nina can answer that uh, better, but uh, I think it's really, really, there, this is not the only test house uh, uh, which has uh, uh, this purpose. But uh, I think our 11 years of experiments uh, uh, in this house really, really characterize this house. Uh, uh, we know really, really uh, where the air goes, uh, what is happening in the crawl space, uh, what's the communication, uh, what is even behind the, the cavity uh, of the, uh, behind the wall, or in the wall cavities, uh, how the moisture uh, uh, interact. Uh, so we, we really, really know this house very well. And uh, what we call building physics. Uh, we did quite a lot of retrofits uh, uh, during in the early phase 
uh, we, for example, just uh, we have a whole variety of ventilation systems and uh, different uh, uh, air conditioning systems built in. Uh, and uh, we have uh, continuous measurements of key uh, building parameters. You will see we move quite a lot of equipment in and out, depends on the experiments, but really, really house is well equipped for continuous measurements of, uh, of, uh, of crucial uh, uh, parameters which define air quality. And uh, uh, that's uh, practically very unique. Uh, also, I want to make sure that uh, uh, you, you're aware already that uh, the, the site where the house uh, uh, is sitting is probably not the, the nicest location, <laughs> but it's really, really crucial so that we have this space uh, around the house. As you will see, uh, the area uh, which uh, our equipment is taking is probably something like five times larger than the house itself. <laughs> and uh, uh, really, really, Pico Research Campus is ideal position for this because we have all the logistics uh, for example, forklifts and uh, uh, moving equipment. Uh, we have, uh, we needed something like 60 kilowatts of electric energy just to power that equipment. And uh, uh, so that's, I don't think that you'll find anywhere else uh, 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 at that. And uh, uh, again, uh, uh, pretty much this center, Center for Energy and Environmental Research was really, really uh, welcoming this project. And I want to acknowledge director and all the, the staff which really, really helped to, uh, uh, to host uh, uh, this large group of researchers and uh, make this project going smooth. Thanks. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome for, thank you for coming and welcome to HomeCam. My name is Marina Vance. I'm an assistant professor of mechanical engineering and environmental engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder. And I'm Delphine Farmer. I'm an associate professor of chemistry at Colorado State University. So as Paula mentioned, uh, one of the key goals of HomeCam is to build community. So that's our title. We're building community through HomeCam. It's a collaborative field study. It's investigating uh, the chemistry of indoor environments. Uh, HomeCam is an acronym. It stands for House Observations of Microbial and Environmental Chemistry. So we do have an M in HomeCam. We are talking about chemistry, but also how the microbiology is affected by the chemistry and affects the chemistry. Um, so there have been other collaborative field studies in the past, collaborative studies that looked into indoor quality. As Rich mentioned, we are standing on the shoulders of many studies that have happened in the past. I'd like to highlight a couple of them just to give you some context. The Pruyopa study uh, stands for Relationships of Indoor, Outdoor, and Personal Air. Um, it took place in the early 2000s and it covered 100 U.S. homes. They were looking at indoor-outdoor relationships of volatile organic compounds, carbonyl compounds, and uh, PM2.5, uh, PM so particulate matter 2.5 microns in diameter or smaller. Um, they had some interesting findings. They saw that there's significant exposure happening indoors or, uh, in relation to outdoors. There's also the office air study that takes place, took place in Europe in the early 2010s and uh, it covered 36 office buildings. So what you can see from these studies is that they gave a lot of insight into the community and they're looking at variability amongst all these different environments. With HomeCam, we're approaching things a little bit differently, right? HomeCam is very unique because it's one house, many, many measurements. So HomeCam, we have, we've taken the approach from outdoor atmospheric chemistry to really bring together a large number of researchers, all with different instrumentation. So we have over 30 state-of-the-art instruments that are characterizing aerosol and gas-based compounds, as well as surface measurements all throughout the house. The, the equipment, we can estimate, is actually worth about $4.5 million, uh, so a little bit more than Attila's test house itself. Um, and uh, we have over 20 faculty members representing 13 universities in the United States and Canada plus several industry and government partners. These are all groups that are sending instrumentation, sending students, or, and, and really working together to collect what's going to be an incredible data set. So at any given time, we usually try to keep it to around 30 to 40 people on site. Um, but we have over 60 researchers who've been coming through the program. And you can see the array of universities that we are representing here. 
So we, we framed this project around quite a few science questions. So the first one that we had was what, are, what, what oxidation chemistry is happening inside? So we, we didn't want to just focus in on, on exposure or just emissions from the toaster, uh, although that's quite fascinating. Uh, we wanted to actually push the realm and think about what chemistry is occurring inside the house. So the first question was what are the oxidants? What are we bringing in from outside? What are we generating inside a home? Our second question was, what, what's the organic carbon inside a house? Um, is it in the gas phase? Is it in the particle phase? What's all the, what's all, what are all the organic molecules that are out there doing? And, and how do they interact between the gas, the particle, and the surfaces? So what does that chemistry do? The third question we had was, what's the reactive nitrogen? So how, how does nitrogen interact inside a home? Is it produced? Where is it coming from? To what extent do we have these different components? So the first part was what are their sources for all of these? How are they impacted by changes in light conditions and human activity? How are we changing the distribution of these different types of molecules? Uh, and finally, how are they affected by outdoor conditions? We have a month here in Texas, and sometimes it rains, and so, <laughs> which is very exciting. Uh, and, and sometimes it is quite hot. Other times it's cooler. How do those outdoor conditions change the chemistry inside? So for home chem, mm -hmm. we have a home environment. So our experimental design, we considered three main categories of perturbations, and we thought about realistic as, as, real, um, as realistic scenarios as we could come up with. So what do you do in your home? You sleep, you cook, hopefully you clean. Um, and we're inside our home, so our own occupation and the use of personal care products might also be altering the indoor environment, right? So then we focus on these three main categories, cooking, cleaning, and the use of personal care products with human occupation as well. Um, with those three categories, we have two different types of experiments. We are sort of in the realm, as Attila mentioned, we're sort of in the realm of a field campaign that's very well understood and very characterized. So we're in between a chamber study and a true field environment where you can't control anything. We're trying to control as much as we can. So um, we have two types of experiments. We are calling the first one a sequential and the second one layered. And you're going to see some of that when you see the, the posters that the students are presenting on the site. Uh, but a sequential experiment is a semi-independent perturbation. So for example, we cook stir fry, we wait for the house to go back to its background levels, we let the ventilation rate do its, the ventilation system do its thing, and then we open up the house for half an hour. Try to get ex uh, outdoor air in, try to bring the, the conditions back to background levels, and then we do it again, and again, and again. So the stir fry is extremely well characterized. By the end of the field campaign, we are going to understand the emissions from this particular stir fry really well. Uh, for, and the same happens for cooking and occupation as well. So for layered, um, layered experiments, we have something that's a little bit more realistic of what would be happening in a home environment. We have uh, volunteers come into the house in the morning. They cook breakfast. They eat. They clean up the kitchen. And then they mop the floors with a uh, pinene-based clean, surface cleaner. And then they hang out in the house. They don't leave the house for the whole day. And then they cook lunch. And then in the afternoon, they clean with a chlorine cleaner. And then they cook dinner. They run the dishwasher. And they leave. So by doing that, we're trying to see if we're layering the emissions throughout the day and if the cumulative air quality is changing over time. So we felt there was a need for both, and you're going to see them staggered throughout this month of activities that we're doing. And just to give you a little teaser of some of the data we've been collecting, uh, one of the experimental days that we have the most fun is Thanksgiving Day. So if you didn't know about this, we're doing Thanksgiving twice at Home Chem. The first time happened this past week. So the data came after the, po the students printed their posters, so we figured we'd give you a little bit of Thanksgiving Day um, data. It was very exciting on site. Everybody was texting each other with results. Th Thanksgiving was a really fun, um, fun day in terms of emissions and indoor quality levels. So what you see in this plot is a time series for the whole day, starting at 8 a.m., uh, volunteers are, are allowed to be in the house before 8 to set up some instruments, calibration, maintenance, whatever. They leave the house before 8, and then we have a little bit of a nice background level, so there's not much going on. 
And in the y-axis, what you see is a mass concentration of particular matter in the air. So it's going to be largely affected by larger particles because, of course, they carry a lot of mass. And then the different lines depend, um, represent the different sizes of particles. So we can see for our breakfast, for example, we have some emissions of very small particles. That's the red and the, and the blue, PM 0.5 and 1, so 1 micron or less. But then we also have these emissions of very, very large particles. And these are probably just from the people walking around. So they're dominating the mass of what, what's happening indoors. But uh, we also have some emissions from the actual cooking activities that are smaller particles. And then throughout the day, we had some other things happening. When we removed the stuffing from the oven, we realized that there's a lot of emissions happening. The toaster has been significant. There's always a toaster peeking. <laughs> this is, I'm very excited about the toaster. And then, as one does on Thanksgiving, somebody burn an oven mitt. Um, and you can tell there's a very clear peak of very small particles, because as you can see, PM.5 is the red line. And then we have 12 guests, and then Brussels sprouts were roasted in the oven. The turkey was being cooked right around here. So in terms of PM <coughs> mass, there is not a whole lot going on with the turkey, but in terms of or volatile organic compounds, there's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> And then we were roasting some veggies, so you can tell the Brussels sprouts got a really nice char in them because the PM was <laughs> increasing. And then we have about, we had about nine guests arrive. So there are four people occupying the house until here, and then nine more arrived. And you can tell the, the very coarse mode particles being picked up from people walking around and moving their clothes, etc. And then they're all eating the dinner, and then their cleaning activities happen as well. And we can tell a little, another little peek. So we have something like this happening every day for different kinds of activities. This was just the Thanksgiving day. And then I wanted to give you a little teaser of some of the, the types of uh, really state-of-the-art instrumentation that we're using. Um, so uh, UC Berkeley sent an array of instrumentation. One of the instruments is something called an SB tag. And what this instrument allows the, the graduate students to do is, is pull in air from the house to the instrument and then measure the total organic compound using a chromatograph. So what you see first are, are all the signals in the instrument in green are from the outdoor air. So there's a lot of different stuff outside, a lot of organic molecules, but nothing compared to that indoor background, that 8 a.m. just before everyone shows up. Inside, there are a lot of different compounds. Peak, uh, peak turkey cooking, uh, you can see in red. And what that shows you is just a vast array of volatiles and particles that are all happening inside the house during Thanksgiving. So you can see this huge number of particles and, and gases and, and huge array of molecules uh, with lots of different chemical properties. So they can all do different things. Um, and so every, every single peak in this chromatogram, every individual line is going to tell its own story. But the collective story that you can see is that indoor air chemistry is really complicated. And it's really, really interesting. So we're going to be spending quite a lot of time dissecting a lot of pieces of data from this and from many, many other instruments that you're going to, you're going to see in a few minutes. So with that, I think we will turn things back over to Leah. Thank you.